Hello, and welcome to the 2023 speaker series presented by New Jersey Chapter of the Fulbright Association. Today's program is co-sponsored by the Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, University of the West Indies, Kingston, Jamaica. Our speaker, Professor Bert Hoffman, is a widely recognized expert on Latin American and Caribbean affairs, or Caribbean, I'm not sure how it is pronounced there. But anyway, I'm Pat Hutchinson. I'm the president of the New Jersey chapter. Uh, this speaker series was established in 2022 to encourage New Jersey Fulbright Association members to introduce themselves and share some of their interests and experience with fellow Fulbrighters. We also host invited speakers on timely topics as we have done for today's webinar. The Fulbright Association is uh, comprised of current and former recipients of Fulbright Awards and supporters of international education. The association represents over 400,000 alumni worldwide. New Jersey has 300 active members of the Fulbright Association, as well as they are alumni and friends both. Uh, we also have thousands of people who live in New Jersey and have traveled abroad on Fulbrights. Additionally, New Jersey has hosted a great many foreign visitors who have come to study here. Exchanges benefit our state economically and educationally. In 2021, nearly 20,000 foreign visitors came to study in New Jersey's colleges and universities. In 2021, roughly 60 New Jerseyans received Fulbright funding for foreign study and for teaching. Fulbrighters represent virtually every field of interest and come from over 165 countries. What ties us together is commitment to advancing mutual understanding, tolerance, and peaceful relations worldwide. So uh, please help me um, in, uh, recognize and welcome Dr. Bert Hoffman, who will be introduced further by our uh, board member, Holger Henke. Thank you, Pat. Good afternoon. I'm Holger Henke. Uh, director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Once again, warm greetings from Jamaica. <laughs> it is my very great pleasure to introduce this afternoon our speaker, Dr. Bert Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman is a political scientist and his work focuses on Latin America in general. Uh, but has an emphasis on Cuba. He holds a PhD degree from the Freie Universität Berlin, where he's also an honorary professor. His daytime job, however, is as lead research fellow of the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, uh, GIGA for short, um, and as the head of their office in Berlin. The uh, Institute, I think, is based in Hamburg, um, but they do have a dependent, dependence um, office in um, Berlin. Uh, Dr. Hoffman's publications include uh, journal articles and books such as Emigrant Policies in Latin America and the Caribbean, Bureaucratic Socialism in Reform Mode, The Changing Politics of Cuba's Post-Fidel Era, Debating Cuban Exceptionalism, uh, together with Lawrence Whitehead, and the politics of the internet in third world development, which was published in 2004. Dr. Hoffman and I worked together twice uh, when he contributed chapters on Cuba in my books, um, co-edited with Dr. Fred Renault in Guadeloupe, uh, titled Modern Political Culture in the Caribbean and New Political Culture in the Caribbean published in 2003 and 2022, respectively. I've always appreciated Bert's contributions for his clear and straightforward style, as well as his substantial insights into the functioning of Cuban polity and society. Um, after having worked together for some 20 years on and off, I was happy to meet Bert in person for the first time last year during a visit in Berlin. So. Bert, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, and I want to thank you for sharing your perspectives on Cuba's current situation and trajectory. 
Uh, of course, we in the Caribbean and here in Jamaica uh, consider the island as a sister nation and neighbor. Um, there have been long-standing diplomatic relations, uh, as well as I should add relationships at the societal level where Jamaicans and other Caribbeans emigrated to, to Cuba and vice versa. So welcome again and over to you. And I know you're sharing with your screen with us. You have a PowerPoint that supports your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Pat and Holger for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to, to be with you in this today. And also thank you very much for those who join uh, uh, via the screen. I really appreciate that. We all have probably had uh, in the time of the pandemic a certain Zoom fatigue. So uh, double points for everybody who still uh, overcomes this fatigue to be here. Um, so I promise you I will uh, share my screen with you on PowerPoint, but I do not have a PowerPoint full of bullet points, but rather uh, images to take you through some of the key things I think that might interest you from current Cuba and from the also Cuban US relations, of course. Um, I guess I just get started. Okay. And uh, please uh, put any question you have in the chat or uh, I, I hope that um, we have time for discussion afterwards, but also if it's somewhere in between uh, go ahead. So here I try to scan, share my screen. That should now work. Here we are. Here we are. Okay, so uh, I will get started. As I said, uh, um, I take it from that moment, uh, which is kind of the moment of the empty chair. And you don't have to be very familiar with Cuba to know whose chair that was. The person sitting next to it is Raul Castro, and the chair is that of Fidel Castro, where he did not sit anymore. That was the first time the authorities convened without Fidel Castro being um, at the helm of the Cuban Revolution. And uh, that is something extraordinary in the country where Fidel was not only for so many years the, the oh, towering figure, but also so towering, so uh, powerful that this has really marked uh, the country. And now it's anybody's judgment for good or bad or for anything in between, but uh, nobody will put into doubt that uh, he left an incredible mark on the country. And um, so even while we since then have a transition, and that is 2006, so that's a long time uh, by now that the transition has started in, in that sense, or the succession, if you want. Um, um, this was from brother to brother, some say, but I say, yes, it was from brother to brother, but it changed the nature of the system. It was no longer this charismatic brand of socialism, this very personalist brand of leadership. But uh, Raul Castro was a very bureaucratic minded leader in the good and the bad uh, 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 ways, he was a much more institutional uh, person. And he was not the man to cheer up the masses for uh, uh, long speeches. Uh, he once said himself, I'm the man of the, the shadows. Um, which is uh, a bit funny to say about uh, yourself, and, but he was a man who had always worked in the second row. And even as he now became head of state and head of the Communist Party and everything, he very much remained the primus inter pares uh, in the Politburo of the Cuban Communist Party, but not anything like the role Fidel had played. And perhaps in the background, you see uh, an. Uh, quite old person in military uniform. And that also is a bit symbolic, um, the military and, and particularly uh, the, the historic generation, as it's called in Cuba, still plays a hugely important role and has played so over the whole uh, transition from Fidel to post-Fidel Cuba. Whoop, that was not intended. 
Um, I take a fast forward now to the next succession, and that is when Raul Castro handed over uh, the reins of government to a younger guy, that's Miguel Diaz Canel on his left, showing the way forward. Um, and that is who is now uh, still the president of Cuba. Raul Castro still is alive and also still influential. I think uh, people tend to tend to assume that he's not uh, anywhere running the present uh, government, but he is still the uh, legitimator of the present government and very important in that sense, even if he's not involved in day-to-day -day politics. So with that, I come to the very present. You just had elections in QA. Maybe you didn't notice because elections in a one-party system are not very exciting. It's very, uh, it's, it's a given who is going to win. Of course, if there's only one candidate and one party, um, uh, it's, it's not an exciting moment. However, these elections were a bit different. But again, I want to use the photo, not just to illustrate uh, something to have to look at, but also to illustrate why these elections are not what we normally consider elections free and fair or whatever. Um, there's the um, where you put your ballot in. You've got two young pioneers, pioneers for socialism, uh, guarding uh, the box and uh, nothing about neutrality. It's Fidel watching uh, from the poster how people are going to vote uh, responsibly for socialism. Um, so it is a very different setting from elections in other countries, but still these recent elections were um, interesting and the outcome was not as certain. I mean, the outcome who wins, yes, but not how. Um, sorry. Um, <coughs> because what people had to look at then is not who wins, but how. And that is voter turnout. That's the uh, key variable. In the past, in the historic past, voting was a socialist duty. Every good citizen went to vote. And even as late as 2003, it was still almost 98% of people voting. That's the historic turnout. So again, nothing to compare with any Western country elections where nobody would ever dream of having 98% of people going to vote, but it's a different country. It mobilizes people to go to vote. That's a proof of loyalty to go to vote. And there are considerable peer pressures uh, to do so. And still in 2008, it was way above 90, uh, 90%, 97 almost. But then abstention has increased quite substantially to what we now had 75%. Um, the second uh, column, uh, sorry, for the brownish column, the second column, the grayish one, is those who voted as was recommended by the government. Because there are different ways what you can do with the ballot. And um, you can vote void. That's, of course, not recommended. You can vote blank. That's, of course, not recommended. You can vote selectively for some of the candidates on the list and for others not. Or you can vote for the full slate. And that is what is the recommended thing to do. That is um, uh, what the government uh, gives out as orientation to do. And there we see that uh, in the recent election, this for the first time ever fell below 50%. So 49% of the people um, voted as was the orientation of government. So now with a result like this, both sides can say, uh, make, can make their story. So um, the official story, of course, is, hey, 76% of people went to vote. Uh, we've got full support uh, still, even in spite of the crisis. And um, that is the resounding, resounding victory for socialism and others say, well, even in a single party system where there's only one party allowed, and they've got all the machinery of state media and mobilization, and they cannot get more than this. So that's 
the two uh, uh, ways, the two readings these elections allow. And in a way, it's the, the takeaway is that even in a single party system, elections can be a very interesting thing to watch if you watch them closely enough. And then again, if you look at the regional data, which I did bring here to, uh, to be too detailed, in Havana, discontent is highest and the uh, rates in Havana are, are much lower than in the rest of the provinces. So with this result, uh, the National Assembly, which was the election, will have all candidates of the Communist Party approved, elected, and they in turn will elect uh, Diaz Canal for another five years as president. That's pretty much a given uh, that this will happen. So that is one thing. You had another event, a uh, little bit uh, more prominent, and that was in July 2021. The biggest public outburst of discontent, to put it in some way, um, on the streets of Cuba. And those images have uh, gone all over the world. I guess it's definitely in the United States, they have been uh, uh, on the screens a lot. And you had some images like this, that's probably the kind of uh, image that was um, less prominent in uh, abroad. So there was some rioting, nothing compared to riots in uh, other parts of the world, but some cars were overturned, some uh, windows broken. And it was quickly disbanded, but was nationwide. You had uh, this outburst all over, not all over, but in many places across the country where people took to the streets, traveled by social media, uh, images from one part to the other. And that's probably the most iconic picture um, that became very famous in those days, showing the re repressive side of government and how this type of uh, uh, public demonstration was repressed. Uh, what is interesting actually is there was one person shot to death, um, which has hardly made it into big news because there was no image of that. Um, and it's, it's amazing how news function of course being shot to death is much more terrible than what this person has to suffer. But if there's no image, there's no image, it doesn't travel through the media the same way as this image did. So on the one side, you have elections, um, even after that, uh, where people go to vote, 75% of the people go to vote, and on the same time, you've got uh, images like this. As I said, things travel through social media. Um, the people taken to the streets was um, kind of, um, the images on the island of, of this event, which was so, so, which is so spectacular because it does never happen. So in other countries, many more people take to the streets, but there the streets are, las calles son para los revolucionarios, the streets are for the revolutionaries, and it's not, everything is under magnifying glass in such a situation. So that, but after this was quickly um, disbanded or, or subdued, now the social media went for something else. The social media went for looking how to emigrate. We have a mass emigration wave after this uh, episode in Havana. Of the, it was in the pandemic, in the wake of the pandemic, flights opened again and Nicaragua uh, opened um, its doors for Cubans to enter visa-free. And so that is the route many, many, many Cubans took, about 220,000 alone in the year 2022 arrived through that route or a similar route in the United, to the United States. So 220,000 in a population of 11 million is quite a lot if you consider that it's not the babies and it's not the old people who emigrate, but it's mostly the more or less young, uh, more or less working uh, age people who emigrate. And that has been a massive, massive drain in Havana. As I said, it was a, via Nicaragua, was a political ally, and uh, it was clearly uh, useful for the Cuban government. 
um, in this logic of exit and voice, this uh, probably some know the scheme of Avador Hirschman, that the easier the exit option is, it will undermine voice or voice raising protest. So it was a typical way how Cuba via immigration uh, had a lot of social pressure being ex exported, if you want, that's not a good term for people, uh, but leaving the country. Almost all of the known want leaders, but that's already saying too much, the known voices of, of the protest, those who were social influencers or some artists or theater people who had been been vocal in, in this, these protests, almost all have gone into exile. Very few of the publicly known uh, persons went into jail. However, quite a lot went into jail, actually, of those people. Um, it, it was really massive. Hundreds were given harsh trials and condemned to, condemned to many years of jail, but mostly no-name people, kind of uh, Lucy Jose Barrio, the kids of the neighborhood, who happened to be in the wrong moment and were taken by, by police. And this was very effective in kind of uh, 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 silencing uh, these type of protests. And since uh, 11 July 2021, we have not seen anything as a repeat performance of this, but we have seen this mass immigration uh, arriving at the US border. And here you see how it has ascended. Fiscal year 2022, here it stays a bit under 180,000. Final count was way above 200,000. And it's been um, not, and that is not counting those who go to other countries. So, what was new for the Cubans is that they went the same way as the Mexicans, the Salvadorians, Hondurans, uh, the, the way over land. Then, if they came into the United States, again, there was a privileged access. Cubans always, after the revolution, had enjoyed privileged access as migrants to the United States and because they were on the right side of the Cold War, because they fled a tyranny and not uh, um, a tyranny of, of uh, that was pro-US American, but they, they were welcomed initially with open arms, then with more mixed feelings perhaps, but they always had a privileged access here, they, in this experience, they had to go the typical migrant route. So we come to the US and I bring the United States now into, into the picture. And um, we had this very, very uh, spectacular moment of reproachment with Obama. I saw in uh, the background of Pat, there is a book with Obama there, I still um, present uh, in, in many ways, but it already seems that it distant the past in many ways. And this reproach at the US, which was so spectacular with diplomatic recognition and even a visit of Obama to, to Havana, all that was quickly undone by the person you know um, after uh, the Obama administration ended. And we had since then a new Cold War with uh, between Cuba and the United States. That meant that Western Union, the remittances, which is such a huge source of income for the island, the money family, immigrated family sends to Cuba, not just in Cuba, everywhere in the Caribbean and many places in Central America and in South America and all over the world. But for Cuba also, um, it was a huge, source of income, the remittances for many, many people. Across this ideological divide you have, Western Union was also forbidden to operate on the island, and um, a lot of sanctions were uh, um, driven up by the Trump administration. And one particularly uh, ugly one was to relabel Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism which you may say uh, is just a label, but this carries an incredible amount of implications for all kinds of things like financial transactions. And um, if I from Germany want to book an Airbnb in Havana, 
which would be private enterprise, that is impossible if the name of Cuba or Havana is on the uh, uh, is, is appearing somewhere. Um, a German bank will not uh, um, operate on this for fear of repression from the United States to get huge, um, huge uh, fines for cooperating with the state sports of terrorism. And um, so that really is, is incredibly disruptive and it's completely un, un, uh, unfounded uh, Cuba. Whatever the Cuban government did in the 1970s, 1960s, uh, 1980s, even supporting left-wing armed groups in Latin America, none of that is current policy or current, not even in the uh, for many years by now. And so this is really an ideological construction um, to, to make US policy uh, more aggressive towards Cuba. And of course, we have a new president, not so new anymore, but uh, 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 who has not the same uh, uh, logic of, of um, polarization with Cuba, and he has restored some normalcy to diplomatic relations and consular services and the like. But most of the sanctions have remained undone, also the state sponsor of terrorism. And it's not easy to undo also, I must say not everything is just a presidential action, but a lot of it uh, still remains in place. And the changes have been much more modest than many people had hoped. So um, we did have the most recent change this year was precisely on migration, where the Biden administration cut short this situation of Cubans going the Nicaragua route up to Mexico, entering because the new law states that they will also be turned back like others. But there's a, a contingent of uh, people that will be accepted to enter legally. Um, so that the number that was given, the 30,000 per year for four for, for countries, one of them being Cuba, and you have to have a sponsor in the United States. So migration will continue. It will continue in different forms, no longer through that um, mass stampede via Mexico, but people will try to get into the United States via this parole program. And I may suppose that again, some privileged access will be there. It's 30,000 for, I think it's Haiti, uh, Mexico, and Venezuela. Um, I think we can assume that it's much easier for Cubans who have relatives in Miami or other parts of the United States to find a good sponsor uh, to get the formalities and bureaucracy done than for Haitians, for instance. So there was change but not at all on the grand uh, scale that the Obama administration had brought. There was no turning back to the engagement policies. So coming now to the domestic side of Cuba, because not everything is determined by the United States, um, what is the situation like? We have a crisis. It's a long, long, long crisis, essentially dragging on since 1989-1990 when the socialist world in Europe and Soviet Union broke up. And I just brought this picture of a photographer, a friend of mine, to remind you that Cuba also was an industrial country once. And uh, if you look at this steel plant, a uh, few people would want to work in there and a few people would even think that this can be easily transformed into world market competitive steel production. Um, and that is kind of the situation of just about every industry on the island. There is one exception I will come to speak uh, about later. That's bio biotechnology. But in a way, we have a lack of investment into everything since the crisis hit in 1989 and uh, the following years, even if there after that moment had been money flows from Venezuela and other uh, places having better times, but still it, it's, the crisis is ongoing. And this is kind of what you also see in the uh, cityscape that the Ministry of Construction 
the slogan was revolution is to construct revolution never was to maintain and that's where you get these pictures everybody knows from Havana this half uh, decayed buildings and um, it's part of this lack of investing in infrastructure which has been dragging on for many many years and which has now by now affected everything from the maintenance of water supply to electricity and well, just about everything This is kind of the international side of it. There was this huge alliance between Cuba and oil-rich Venezuela, which still is there, but not uh, in any way in the dimensions it had been before because of the, uh, the crisis of Venezuela itself and the lack of the, the, the amount of oil coming from Venezuela has been greatly reduced. So that is another part of the current crisis. And just to give you an idea of the scale of crisis, so that's sugarcane. Sugarcane is the most traditional of traditional products you can have for Cuba. Cuba once was the world's largest producer of sugarcane, um, the sugar island it was called. And now um, I have one statistic just to give you an idea of where we are. So this is since basically the revolution uh, started in 1959, 1960, and then all through the good years of socialism, it was somewhere going up and down uh, until the collapse of the Soviet Union, when it was still at above uh, 7 million tons. From then it collapsed, it halved, it halved again, and by now it, and in, in the last two years, it halved again, more than halved again, but now we are at 5% of the production they had in 1970. It cannot even, uh, it's no longer an exporter. It uh, does not have enough sugar for the for domestic consumption for the first time ever. So this is just an idea of what we speak about when we speak about crisis. Um, and that has to do with a lot of things. Of course, uh, gasoline is not coming sufficiently. The, machinery is uh, obsolete, but also salaries are incredibly poor and there's no motivation really to work for, for it. So a lot of it comes together, but just to give you in, for, in one product, uh, the dimension of the, of the collapse we see. And of course, the COVID pandemic hit Cuba extremely hard as all tourist dependent countries. Cuba has, tourism has become the number one industry, if you want to call it an industry in the, in the country. And it fell from one day to the other, like in other countries, but in Cuba, it really, really uh, cut into an already very uh, crisis-ridden situation and uh, has made things so bad in terms of living standards that it was not really a surprise that at some moment it would take to the streets in, uh, in terms of protest. But wasn't there reform? Wasn't there also reform? And yes, there was, and there is. So this is an image, which is a very different Cuba. That's a private upscale <laughs> restaurant catering basically for tourists and for Cuban Americans who come to visit and a few of the also existing newly rich in Cuba or even old rich in Cuba. Um, so the, that's uh, kind of the height of private enterprise, but most of private enterprise is that it's small scale street vendors, uh, and I don't know how much money you will make even if you sell all of your uh, goods uh, at a day. It's very very small scale enterprise. It's nothing if we speak of opening to enterprise nothing uh, like what Vietnam or, or China had done, the scale again is much different. The bed and breakfasts and the restaurants have been kind of the, uh, the, the spareheads of, of market reform and that is small enterprise by international standards. And one reform that was never really mentioned as an economic reform, but which has enormous economic implications was the liberalization of migration. Cubans basically are allowed to travel abroad without restrictions. If 
I mean, there are some restrictions for those who have to do military service. There are some restrictions for those who have just finished university, have to stay two years. But basically, um, even dissidents have been able to travel abroad. And everybody else can travel abroad if they get in on the other place. So the bottleneck is no longer being able to leave Cuba, but to get into Nicaragua, United States, Madrid, wherever you want to go. Getting a, Euro, a visa from Europe, of course, is a difficult thing. Um, so but that has meant that a lot of Cubans have become uh, been able to travel. And this has nurtured a whole pity import trade business. So if you see all those uh, smartphones people have, mobile phones people have in Cuba, not even 5% of these are be, have been bought in Cuba in any official store. All this has come in by either relatives from the immigrant community or by this pity import uh, by Cubans traveling in and out of the country and much else, not only sm uh, smartphones. That's why I put it here in economic reform. So what has emerged from this dual effect of crisis and of new market possibilities is that oh, new inequalities have emerged and the terrible thing in a way that they are very much following the patterns of the old pre-revolutionary inequalities. So here I take you to a research project we have been conducting uh, with actually empirical research in Cuba um, on those new old inequalities. And the data are all pre-COVID, pre but the trend is, uh, has remained the same and some things have even been, been accelerated by COVID and by the pandemic in this regard. So I now take you to a few data and let me have a look. At, is there anything, Holger, do you see in the chat if there's anything? Uh, well, maybe you can see it myself. No, so far, I don't see, but we're encouraged okay. to formulate a question. That we can... well, but, but if not, we have it uh, all together uh, at the end of the presentation. That makes a lot of sense, too. So here, just uh, give you an, a sense of what I mean with new and old inequalities. According to official data, uh, it's not a T-search project, it's a research project, so <laughs> um, there is hardly any data according to what in Cuba is termed skin color. That's how the statistics in Cuba uh, term it. That's why we uh, take it here. And the official uh, story is that there are no significant differences. Uh, for those who read Spanish here, it says uh, that's an, an official document by the statistics institutes. And it says the differences according to the skin color we find in this study are not significant from the statistical point of view, there are no marked differences. This, of course, is very much at odds of what everybody in Cuba easily can see, um, because it just takes into account the state salaries and the cubic peso salaries, and there is not much difference in that. But of course, income is not only that. We come to that later on too. But income basically is in hard currency where really the differences emerge. So we took to a research project and we were able to conduct a survey. So I say we, that's a project I did together with Katrin Hansen. Um, and we did a nationwide survey with more than 1,000 uh, people, so 1,000 respondents. And it was, was semi-representative according to quite a few measures. Uh, ethnic distribution, geographic distribution, um, age groups and the like. Of course, not in the same way as you could do it ideally in a, in a country where things are much more open. Um, and if you want to read it in detail, that's kind of the, the bibliography where we published it. But I take you to some of the findings, just briefly. Remittances. So in orange, that's white, uh, uh, always in, in uh, phenotypically white. We have a whole discussion about uh, the wording, of course, and that is by self-description. People were asked to, to self-identify or Afro-Cubans. Um, so clearly remittances go much more to the whites than to the Afro-Cuban population, which is clear because the immigrant community were those who were pre-59, the privileged groups, 
who left the island and the sugarcane cutters and the underprivileged uh, uh, Afro descendants had not that much reason to immigrate. So the exile community, immigrant community is overwhelmingly white and remittances travel along family lines. So no surprise really that remittances and remittances, we are speaking of one of the two major sources of income of the country. It's really uh, a lot of money and not just little money and overwhelmingly go to the white population. Very interesting then is we are those who don't get remittances. Why don't you get remittances? So among the phenotypically white uh, respondents, we have 62% of these say, I don't get remittances because as bien, I'm well, I don't need them. Whereas among the black population, 85% say, well, I don't have anybody abroad who could send money. 85% say, we just don't have family abroad who could send money. And not a single uh, uh, Afro-descendant in our sample said, as bien, I am well. And nobody, we just had zero respondents who, who said that um, of the Afro-Cuban Cuban population we had in our sample. So that's kind of a stunning difference. Um, Again, uh, we can see it if we go through the um, businesses, the private sector operations. So if we have people, people of color, I, 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 I don't even want to call it, um, we have very different type of activities. So the biggest chunk here is 28%, that's uh, small scale vending uh, on the street, streets. Whereas among the white population, you've got this huge uh, orange chunk, which is they rent out some housing in some way. And 4% there's restaurants. Restaurants is completely absent in the Afro Cuban. So why is that? Because you had to do that in your private property housing. You could not, uh, it's not full scale uh, business. You cannot construct a house and open a restaurant or, or buy, you had to do it in your private homes. And who had attractive and large enough private homes to rent out for tourists to establish a well-running restaurant for tourists like the one you saw in the pictures? Of course, those who belong to the former well-off classes, and that happened to be whites, uh, to the exceptions, of course, but to a large extent, because really pre-15 Cuba was an extremely racist race structured society. And that had been actually one of the biggest, biggest accomplishments of the Cuban revolution to have overcome that legacy of uh, social racial structure. So it's very, very bitter for many to see this type of restructuring along those old lines. And again, you see it all through the data we have. Uh, if you see how much they earn, uh, from the businesses, um, it's only whites who are in the high income uh, uh, segments. But also, it's such an easy question do you have a bank account? Not a, a, a dollar bank account, but a regular, but do you have a bank account? Of the whites in our uh, uh, sample, half of them, 50%, had it. Among the Afro descendant, 15%. So on such a simple question, money didn't matter that much in socialist Cuba, of course, and having a bank account was not that important. Now, if you, and the more market mechanisms are coming in and the more important remittances are, and we see that by now you have uh, uh, bank cards uh, to, to buy in the, in the hot currency shops, it is a huge unlevel playing field within Cuba. As I said, these data are dictated by now, it's definitely more than this, but the trend is kind of the same and it gives, shows you on what different starting grounds people enter the race of market conditions in Cuba where they have opened up. And again, I think it's the last slide from our uh, research project, second citizenship. Cubans have uh, had the possibility to acquire second citizenship on occasions, and mostly by Spanish law on, um, uh, for those who had Spanish, it was called the granddaddies, the grandparents law, those of Spanish ancestry. 
So by and large, having Spanish ancestry was a thing that was not equally divided among blacks and uh, whites, as you can imagine. And in our sample, we have um, whites without, uh, with just one Cuban nationality in citizenship, 51%, and, and uh, Afro-Cubans with just one Cuban nationality, but we have 6% of whites who also have a different passport, which is a huge advantage because you can travel so easily if you have an EU passport, you can import export easily, you can open, a, you can get a credit card, you have a bank account in Spain, whatever. And we just have no, the, kind of the fourth uh, segment is missing. We don't have any Afro-descendant with dual citizenship. I don't say that in Cuba there is none, it's a sample, it's all relative, but the trend is overwhelmingly that also this um, clearly favors those who had been the favorite parts of society in pre-59 Cuba. So coming back to that picture, now you can see a bit more behind uh, this anecdotal evidence here. You don't see the person living in that nice house with that nice car, but you may imagine that uh, from the statistics, and how that will be different than the building on the right hand side. So that is always the question of where do you compare it with? Don't other countries have more severe inequalities? Yes, it definitely is very much more severe social inequality probably in other countries, but it is so much more pressing for a country that is a socialist country which strives on uh, all pride is in having uh, some social equality at the basis of the merits of the system. And it's not the same politically or socially, and people experience it very differently. So let me come now to the currencies. I already mentioned it, that it makes a big difference in what currency you earn your income. But here I probably come to illustrate what a good Cuban friend of mine once said. Cuba is not a communist country. Cuba is a complicated country. So this is the traditional Cuban peso. And they've got high inflation uh, by now. So they had to print higher denominated bills. So the good old three peso Che Guevara bill is not really worth anything anymore. And even the thousand pesos uh, if you go to the government exchange house now, it's not even $10 anymore. And the black market, it's even less than that, of course. So that is the Cuban peso, the national currency. <coughs> and they have introduced now, they did away with what they had before, a dollar packed so-called convertible Cuban peso, but they reintroduced it as bank money. So you can have a bank account in hard currency, dollars or euros <laughs> um, as a Cuban. And then you can get a bank card. And with that, you can buy in the hard currency shops, which have become a whole retail set, in uh, retail store set, uh, in where you buy all that, which is not really available on the Cuban peso market anymore. And that is not luxury products. That starts with everything from frying oil to uh, noodles or, or chicken or what you want. And anything that goes beyond what is being sold on the agricultural markets. And um, of course, the, the black market takes all kinds of currencies that, that will not take bank cards. Um, so those bank cards effectively are a dollar packed Cuban uh, dollar substitute. Then, of course, you have the dollar circulating in kind and also the euro circulating in kind. Um, officially, you cannot buy anything anywhere with that, but if you want to get out of the country via the migration route to the US, that costs it about uh, $10,000 and they will not want to take Cuban money and not Cuban uh, uh, bank card money. But for that, you need effective money. So how did people get $10,000 to do that route? Um, I that was money by their friends or relatives usually in the US who sponsored that, or they sold a house, or they sold a car, or well, 
there's not much other property of, of that worth um, there. So there's a whole circulating uh, system there. And actually, some of that money is not even circulating in Cuba, but some of that money is being transferred from one Miami bank account to another bank account in Miami, and the house or car has passed ownership in Cuba via that way. So some speak of dual currency system in Cuba. I think it's way more complex, and we get into much more complexity still because you also have the libretta. That's a currency in kind, in a way. The libretta is the, the, the little booklet, not the translation, which all Cubans have and which gives them access to extremely highly subsidized goods in the uh, state uh, in state shops for the necessities of uh, consumption, not for all of uh, what anybody would need, but to a ground floor, which some say, in some in official Cuba say, which lasts kind of 10 days. Uh, it's not even sure uh, how much that is. But what definitely is sure that without the rice and beans you get through that system, um, which you almost don't have to pay for, it's almost symbolic what you pay for that. Um, without these rations, people, many people would not know how to how to make ends meet in Cuba and would not get uh, uh, sufficient calories input to make a living. And then, of course, you have another currency, and I put the symbolic picture here. That's kind of what in Cuba is called merit, merito. And um, if if you are uh, in some official position or if you have some uh, function, of course, uh, if you are a high-ranking military, you will have a car um, and the like. Uh, and this is not unimportant. This type of non-currency currency uh, still is a key explanation also why people stay, even when they stay in employment, if they uh, not necessarily for salary, but for the offspin they can get from that state employment in terms of goods, in terms of access to certain things. So the situation is much more complicated than just looking at money. I come to what are the key accomplishments, education. That's incredible. Everybody goes to school still today and schools are up and running and they are not uh, extremely segregated. And that definitely is an accomplishment of the revolution, but also the erosion has taken place. It's very unattractive to be a school teacher. You earn just a state salary, have no goods passing through your hands, which you could sell on the black market. So many, many, many school teachers have left that profession and went into tourism or wherever they could make more money or abroad. So you really have uh, uh, an outcry of many people that the school system is no longer what we thought it it should be or what it had been, but still it's in place. And the same for the health system. Um, you can always look at the bright and the not so bright side. So the health system in the COVID pandemic had really its glory moment and its uh, tragic moments. So. The tragic moment was that they had a very high fatality rate and when the Delta wave hit the island, um, the vaccination campaign had not yet started, or um, it had started, but it had not yet covered the, any, any major part of the population. And the Delta virus very severely hit the island, which is a very aged population. And in that situation, the hospitals were completely overrun. And the most iconic, terrible thing is that the plant which produced medical oxygen and 95% of the medical oxygen on, on the island, that plant collapsed to, to obsolete, uh, obsolete infrastructure in some way which had not been properly maintained for the demand that now was coming into. So at the very moment of the highest demand, uh, that key product to keep people alive was no longer available. So that really was absolutely traumatic for the Cuban population, which really, uh, whatever their political um, other opinions are, but just about everybody 
was proud of their medical system. And this collapse in the COVID pandemic was really dramatic. On the other hand, Cuba developed its own COVID vaccines, which worked. And this, I say, it's, it's a glory. It's, it's incredible that there's so few companies or countries developed a proper vaccine. The own vaccine would just have, uh, and, and Cuba did it, and they developed two vaccines. And I really found amazing. Um, so they had have a biotech sector. And here I give you again a little illustration from the from the bills. So there was traditionally Che cutting sugar cane, and on the 50 peso bill, you've got the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. So that's in the late 80s where they started to build up a huge biotech sector. And this biotech sector is the one industry that is up to up to international uh, standards and more because, as I said, this center developed one of the two vaccines. The other uh, is called Abdallah. The other vaccine is Soberana. And here you see me visiting the colleagues at uh, the National Vaccine Institute um, who developed the Soberana uh, uh, vaccine. I am part of a, of a research consortium with um, mostly people from medical, the medical field here in Germany, the Charité, the, the, the most uh, the, the, the most central uh, university center for virology of the country is the lead in that. Um, and we have a project together, all Central American, Mexican, and, and countries in Cuba on um, infectious diseases and how to prevent them. And I'm one of the two people going for the for the social and political aspects of that. So we cooperate with the, with the Cuban colleagues and it's so I, I've got quite quite good insights into, into the process. And it's just amazing that none of the German or European pharma companies except AstraZeneca, BioNTech, which is what developed the Pfizer product, was not even a major company before, before it developed that product. All those who Spire sharing didn't develop anything uh, uh, that worked, or, or most of them didn't try to develop a vaccine. Pfizer didn't develop a vaccine. Pfizer bought the vaccine developed by BioNTech. And all our companies kind of failed to be up to, to, to the challenge, not all of them, thankfully, but so many. Whereas little Cuba, with all the limited resources, did so. It's old school. It's an old school vaccine, not uh, not mRNA. mRNA. Uh, it probably is a bit less potent, but it worked. And as soon as they got the the campaign, the vaccination campaign underway, they really had the problem of COVID solved on the island. However, the backside is that they had to dedicate so many resources on that that. Here that the uh, national newspaper, we have to uh, use such a big chunk of our budget on the COVID development that we only had 50% of financing to uh, acquire the raw materials necessary for the medications of uh, or any kind of other basic medications. So that since then, all kind of medications in Cuba are lacking. So that's again. Uh, two sides of the story. I am running out of time. Uh, I just want to finish up now. Um, new friends, that's uh, Diaz Canel in Moscow, uh, where they put up uh, Fidel Castro statue, but also new friends, that is a Turkish power ship. And uh, by now, seven Turkish power ships are producing uh, energy for electricity for the island, which has solved a bit the most immediate pressures on the electricity consumption. And my last slides are kind of taking you to the cityscape again in a longer view. This cityscape in Havana is very nicely marked by the powers of their times because they always had this, we built the high and towering buildings. So in the capitalist times, uh, in the Batista times pre-59, that was the Banco Nacional. 
a building that shows we got the power and a capitalist system, the bank has got the power. It's a huge building after the revolution was turned into a hospital because you didn't have much need for, for a bank and state of socialism. In Soviet times, this Soviet embassy built that tower, which the architect uh, designed that's a sword ramped into the soil in front of the, that's the idea the architect had to show the Americans. I think it's a not so nice metaphor if you are the soil um, in which this sword is ramped and the Cubans came to call it the control tower, like an airport control tower. And in today's Cuba, this building is being built and that's on the right, that's how it is supposed to look like when it's done. And that's what the Cubans call the Torre Lopez Calleja in the streets. It's going to be a luxury hotel run by the Cuban military, uh, owned by the, by the military holding Gaesa, which was under the guidance of this general, who happened to be the son-in-law of Raul Castro. And actually, uh, that had been one of the least noticed hugely important events. This person who is a whole generation younger than Raul Castro and who was clearly the most powerful person in the Politburo died last year, uh, younger than the older generation, but that left a complete power vacuum behind the scenes in Cuba where we don't really know how that was to be, how that's going to be filled. But again, monumentalizing the power structure in this building, which many, many, many Cubans in Havana find obscene in a situation where everything is lacking and we are building this super modern luxury hotel when we already have so many hotels and not enough tourists coming to the island to, to fill the spaces and to fill the rooms. So with that, I leave you Cuba's future. Let's discuss it. It's, I leave it with a question mark here just to, um, I think we have a few items on the, to discuss. Just finishing with that, Cuba and the United States here kind of symbolically present in this young couple will always have both some uh, impact on how these lives on the island will be will be playing out in the future. And I very much hope that we see change from the US side on uh, being getting out of this Cold War logic towards Cuba. And of course, I also wish for the Cuban side to, to get out of this crisis and this political inertia and this reform inertia we are seeing at present. So with that, I would leave you. I hope you're still with me and stop sharing the screen and i'm very much looking forward to now have you give me your ideas opinions concerns questions criticism throw it at me right thank you so much bert um that was a far-reaching um discussion about current situation uh some of the history as well of cuba let me just turn on the light, it's uh, dark here. Um, as he's doing that, I'm repeating that we're very much inviting your questions, the participants. It's dark here in Germany already, so. Yes. Okay. Put, the, put your questions into the chat, preferably, if you can. Um, if for some reason that shouldn't work, feel free to send them by email very quickly to me. I put my email address in the, um, in the same set chat which I hope you can see. Um, I see we have several colleagues from or in the Caribbean in our webinar. So I anticipate some curiosities. Yeah, now. there's a hand raised by Lauren. Okay. Lauren. But we can't actually make him speak, I believe, Pat. Can we? No. Pat, you're also... It would be nice if... if they could ask if they could speak up if that's technically possible. Pat, your microphone is off. Yeah, it looks like we can do that. So let's let's give it a try. If someone would like to uh, ask a question in person, put your hand up and we'll we'll. Uh... Can you do? Lo Lauren Waybright had her hand up. So I'm not even sure I'm seeing the hand up. 
There's a hand from Lauren Waybright. Yeah, Lauren. Oh, there is. Um, microphone needs to be on. Okay, Lauren, go ahead. So is is it? Uh, do you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Let me let me turn on my uh, video. I don't know where the video part is. Let's see. Uh, I can't I can't turn on the video. But anyway, okay. my, I, I'm in uh, teacher education. And I well, retired now. But uh, what is the situation for the future teachers of uh, Cuba? Okay. Mm. Well, the, the problem with the teaching had been a very emblematic um, profession of the social progress the revolution had brought. It was a, a piece of pride to be a teacher. And that has changed quite a bit due to the crisis of the state salaries. And a teacher, if he earns now, I think it's less than $30 uh, on the informal or even formal exchange rate. So that has become so unattractive for people. Um, and so many, many teachers have dropped out. They have reintroduced um, teachers who had been pensioned, who had already gone into, into um, retirement. They have reactivated them to fill the gaps. And a lot of the gaps are also being filled by um, video teaching. They use quite a bit of video teaching um, where there may be a teaching person in the room, but who doesn't really do the teaching itself, but rather managing the class. And that has become attractive by, for some because that had been a modality how you could move from the provinces to Havana because the internal migration uh, also is re highly restricted, but that had been a way to move to, to the capital. So in that situation, uh, what they would need is a real pay rise, but that is not very much in the cards uh, at present, given the really dramatic economic situation. So what many do is moonlighting and giving English classes in private to the English teachers or preparing students after, um, after, after the school days, preparing them for exams. And that even has become a legal um, uh, uh, private business to become uh, kind of, they don't call it teacher, repasador is the word, uh, to be <laughs> preparing for exams person. So that's one of the ways how they make ends meet to, while staying in, in the profession. Many, many really very much like, and I'm always, as with the medical professions, I'm always very much impressed by the dedication you still see with so many people in spite of really depressed salaries. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren, for the question. Mark Laviolette has a question, um, and I'm going to read. Can we say that US new policy to Cuba is challenging China's looking to the Caribbean islands? That's two questions in one. So what is the new US policy towards Cuba? Um, it has been just uh, getting rid of the rhetoric of the Trump times, bringing in some more common sense, some more, uh, I mean, one example now, the, the consulate in Havana works as a consulate. Before Cubans who wanted to do any consular uh, service, uh, applying for going to a conference or wherever, uh, whatever they wanted, would have had to travel to Guyana to do to tram it to to, to 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 do the bureaucratic thing. So, and then you didn't even get it. So to participate in I don't know a, a Fulbright meeting in New Jersey, um, they couldn't even go to the consulate, but had to travel to Guyana on an immense cost uh, question. Um, and that kind of chic uh, chicane, do you know the word in English? I mean, just being nasty, just making things difficult on purpose, which was Trump administration stuff that Biden has, has returned to normalcy. He 
he also has opened up uh, some uh, remittances possibilities and he has done some things but it's not the new us cuba policy many of us had hoped for kind of um it's still uh in that sense that's the first part of the question now uh, competing with china actually china is not that big in cuba and um, it's not bigger in cuba than many other parts of the of the world um the china didn't go much into investment neither in the tourism sector not nor in the one mineral uh, resource cuba has that's nickel and um, china has provided a lot of the telecom infrastructure that certainly but where has china not done so i mean it's um and, and of course they've got privileged political relations to some extent because they're both run by communist party but the cuban government evidently had hoped to get more substance from in terms of support from china than than it has got so china is not really as big as many people think not much bigger than elsewhere in the caribbean and, and the world russia is uh, playing much more a cuban card i mean now with the ukraine uh, situation along Ukraine, you don't really see that. But before that, China, Russia sent military vessels to Cuba to show great power ambition and, and this type of thing. Things China didn't do. Okay, th thanks, Bert. Um, I do have two questions. Pat had her hand up, and well, Pat, Pat Hutchinson in New Jersey had her hand up, and um, Pat North over here in Jamaica has also asked the question. So. Pat, New Jersey Pat, first. Pat, your microphone. I'm sorry, I was just experimenting with the, the hand I was trying to. <laughs> oh, good. So Pat um, in Jamaica, Pat Northover, um, actually here at Salises, where I'm working, one of our senior fellows, um, is asking, has Cuba made a statement in the Ukraine war? Um, I reckon that probably said something perhaps in the United Nations, um, uh, but um, question goes to you, Bert. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question because Cuba really had a diplomatic high, uh, high wire act in that regard, because uh, on the one side, of course, uh, everything US and NATO is uh, the enemy side. And usually it's a clear thing that uh, they would follow the Russian narrative, and to a large extent, they do. However, in the in the initial important vote, uh, vote in the United Nations, Cuba abstained and gave, gave a whole declaration. And the abstention is also very clear because um, if you look at it from a small country neighboring with an imperial big country, Cuba sees some parallel. I mean, it's, uh, Ukraine is not quite as small but compared to Russia. And the, the Russian uh, idea of this is our sphere of influence. This is our neighboring territory here. We kind of uh, have our legitimate security interests and we should have our, the, a say who can and who cannot govern in Kiev. If you read that from a Havana position, I mean, that's what the Cuban revolution run up against that uh, the United States has this kind of attitude towards Cuba to say this is our sphere of influence, this is our security concern, this is where we have uh, the final say on things. So that's why Cuba abstained. At the same time, uh, apart from that diplomatic abstention, um, the, the Cuba state media take over the Russian narrative almost uh, one one on one and, and you just saw Diaz Canal in uh, Moscow uh, with the inauguration of the Fidel Castro monument I mean um, for most practical purposes Cuba is clearly an ally of of Russia in that sense but it would not give up its kind of uh, we are a block free nation we are not uh, we are against empires uh, having divided up the world into spheres of influence. So that's diplomatically, that is very interesting. 
Thank you. And there's a sort of a follow-up question that was from Fred Renault in what look um, what is the impact of the war in Ukraine on relations between Cuba and the USA? Uh, I mean, of course, not helpful, but in relations with the USA, it couldn't sour much. I mean, because they were that bad already, and um, and it really the Ukraine war has not been a watershed in that regard. Um, I think the repression of the 11 July uh, demonstrations was much more important in the sense of the progressive side not being able to push the Biden administration to a more to a more progressive Cuba policy. Um, I think that was much more much more important. Um, but the uh, to take the question, one of the important impacts of the Ukraine war on Cuba is that Russian tourists no longer come. The Russian tourists had become a source of tourism for, for the island, a semi-important one. And also the, that uh, import costs have gone up for things and it has been highly disruptive also for, for um, kind of, kind of, uh, Cuba's relations, also with West Europe, Western Europe, for instance. For, I mean, for Western Europe, it has become important now to see which side are you on, and that's why we have a whole lot of diplomacy towards Latin America and Africa and uh, the rest of the world um, with more intensity. And then it is respected that Cuba did this uh, high wire act in the United Nations, but still. Um, Cuba and a few other countries in Latin America are kind of siding with Russia, and that is, uh, for instance, we had the discussion to have a German cultural institute opening up in Havana. There was for some time um, uh, under the Obama uh, years where everything looked much brighter, the discussion of having development cooperation with Cuba and all the kind of things, and nothing of this would fly now anymore. They will not, in the present circumstances, uh, there's no discussion of opening a cultural institute in Havana. Just as a little, little example of where things have got more difficult. Okay. Thank you, Bert. Um, Pat Northover had a follow up question, um, and it's a sort of a comparative question. And of course, Shakespeare has said comparisons are odious. But we make them nevertheless all the time. No, comparisons are good. So everybody makes them. So she's asking um, if Taiwan, if we look at that, um, uh, is a correlate of the Bay of Pigs uh, in, in terms of the geopolitical tensions that we have been seeing in recent times there in that area of the world. I didn't catch what the Bay of Pigs uh, mean. That's right. Well, in terms of, of China um, trying to um, exert greater direct pressure on Taiwan than it has perhaps in previous um, years. Okay, that, that, I mean, I, I really am not an expert on China-Taiwan uh, relations, and I don't really think that uh, this... Let me see what angle would it be that Cuba would look at Taiwan. Um, I mean, they definitely would side with China. They don't recognize Taiwan. Um, that is clearly the case. But Cuba was, mm, I mean, let's take the parallel of Saddam Hussein in, invading Kuwait. Um, by and large, Cuba would have been with Saddam Hussein against the rich oligarchs of Kuwait who didn't share the wealth of their oil. Um, basically in that scheme. However, Fidel Castro was very clear, um, and he, he said so, uh, in, that it's an incredible mistake. You never should invade a country like this. You don't pick such a fight. You don't want to be the invader. Um, just in the same way as Cuba never tried to reconquer Guantanamo Bay by force. Of course, Cuba always has clear that that is Cuban territory, that the US presence in Guantanamo Bay 
is absolutely colonial and that uh, it should end, but it's completely off the card that the Cuban government would, I don't know, take any military action to change that situation. So, so Cuba was very cautious in this regard and uh, therefore would not be, uh, if we translate that to China, China Taiwan, um, would never kind of suggest to the Chinese to invade Taiwan. If it ever comes to that, well, let's not speculate, but uh, it will be similar to the Russian situation, I guess, with Ukraine. Thank you, Bert. I'm not seeing any other questions at the, <clears throat> at the moment. Um, but if I can ask you, perhaps. Yeah, sure. Um, to um, look into your magic glass ball. Yes. Okay. Into the future a little bit, and I want to use a statement from um, David Jessop, whose name you certainly know, um, uh, who has, um, said in an article late last year, no one is asking what happens if US pressure succeeds. And there's an internal breakdown of order in Cuba, people flee, and their relatives across the Florida Straits help them triggering long-term instability and offshore opportunity for narco-traffickers or worse, causing further harm to the Cuban people. Or alternatively, whether the US or Cuba really want the island to again become eco economically dependent on, on Russia. So, okay, I, I usually try to find a somewhat optimistic and um, this is not really helpful in that regard. <laughs> Um, uh, of course, um, it's 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 a possible scenario. Of course, at some point, um, uh, things can can fall apart, and if they start to fall apart, things can fall apart quickly. That's I mean, I, I'm living in Germany, uh, and the GDR fell apart within six months, basically. I mean, it's uh, uh, I've seen. The escalation effect uh, uh, very firsthand this can have, and how people turn around who had been in one position and uh, the next day they are on the uh, opposite camp. And um, so I'm I'm not naive about about that, um, but it's not what I foresee at present. Um, what I uh, my magic ball tells me. <laughs> that the most plausible scenario actually is uh, a meddling through the way uh, Cuba has meddled through uh, the last years. Uh, I don't foresee a great recovery, uh, neither economically nor socially, but I don't foresee a collapse. I was in, in, in Havana no, just, just two and a half months ago. There's nothing that indicates Paramount on the streets at present. Uh, there's a lot of frustration. I mean, nobody is happy with the situation they're in, but that's a different thing. Um, so, so much for my glass bar, but there's this, a, a different aspect to the question. So, would the United States really want it? Would the Cuban immigrant community really want it? Or aren't they most happy to have? this enemy there they can point to and the worse cuba is the better it is for them to to be in miami and to be able to point see that is what communism is like and that is terrible and and that definitely is <coughs> is a function which is completely cynical if you think about the people that are suffering through that but it is politically incredibly powerful. We have it all across Latin America, the same with Venezuela. And um, whatever leftist candidate there is, Boric or Petro or Colombia or whatever, um, the opposition, the right wing opposition would say, he will take us down the Venezuela way. Look what Cuba is like. Do you want to see there the people are fleeing from? And the worse the situation in Cuba is, the more functional it is to this uh, conservative right-wing discourse. And therefore the question really is kind of justified. Uh, do the people maybe me really want, uh, want this to change? Would, they definitely would 
uh, it would be complete challenge in so many ways. I mean, here in Germany, I tell the people that have Havana is closer to Miami than Dresden is to Bonn. I mean, it's 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 just half an hour uh, by plane. You could commute every day. Uh, it's it's really um, not easily foreseeable um, that a major change in Cuba would not also bring incredible challenges to to the South Florida community, at least. And, and politically, I think there are many people living off the conflict very well and have an interest in having this conflict ongoing. Okay. Good. Thank you so much, Bert. I don't know if you want to give a positive thing at the end. Um, but um, I think we have certainly exhausted. Uh, uh, well, Fred actually, Reno asked the question a while ago, could economic difficulties lead to political changes in your opinion? Maybe we make that the last question and answer. And if you want to give it a positive spin that you're looking for, go well, ahead. Well, it is. And of, of course, uh, economic, the economic situation is leading to, to economic and political changes. We, I mean, just uh, be it the private sector as small as it is, it's definitely different to not having it. Take the opening to world cell phones and uh, social media. It has happened. It has really changed the landscape. The Cubans are connected worldwide and are on Facebook with their friends in Miami or with their family. All this is part of, of the changes that have taken place. And the positive scenario is, of course, that the, not of course, my positive scenario is that within the governing elite, um, we, we have somehow uh, overcoming the impasse between making a reform step, step uh, retreating with that, uh, every reform step, then a bit later someone puts a restriction on this, this tug of war, which you see in a, in a really incoherent policy approach over the last, I don't know, 20 years almost. Um, and that the balance of power would come to uh, go away that you have a certain opening towards the economy and also towards society. And I'm not speaking of uh, having multi-party elections the, the Westminster way or whatever way uh, soon, but opening a meaningful dialogue and, and plural, opening for pluralism within the Cuban Society, which definitely is there. I mean, it's 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 there, and it doesn't find any communication with the with the established, uh, meaningful communication with the established uh, political channels. That is not of the cards. I think that is something that could happen. And if the Obama policy would have prevailed, um, that really was, you could say, the threat there was that there was a space opening for some reform way going that way. And of course it's spoiled milk now. Um, and that's not the only thing we could uh, cry about uh, from, from what followed the Obama years, but it definitely was um, a way where many Cubans saw a way forward, which was not a full scale capitulation and uh, mea culpa on everything, but a, a, a transition which people could go with upright biographies, let's say. And I hope that we get into a situation again where this becomes a viable option. Okay, that's a good note to end on, I think. Um, Bert, thank you so much um, for your wonderful presentation and answering all the questions our participants had, and we had a small hardcore group that persisted throughout the time we had for this webinar, and I'm thanking them as well for your questions, for your participation, wow. your presence, and we look forward to continuing these conversations in the future in some way. Uh, it's great to see everybody. Pat, thank you so much for your assistance <laughs> in New Jersey. Um, Bert, wonderful evening. Uh, back to you in Berlin. Uh, well, from, from my side, thank you very much again for organizing this, for having me, and also for participating. And I, 
I hope to see some of you in the Caribbean and Jamaica or elsewhere uh, or in New Jersey if they happen to let me in again into the United States. So uh, thank you very much for being here and have a good day. Good. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.